Well, I asked them not to run the roll in just so that I'd have a few more minutes. Um, I'm not sure where the Holy Spirit is going to take us today, but I know he wants to take every one of us to the next level. Are you ready to go to the next level with him on this Pentecost Sunday? You know, God never is okay with his kids just settling in and getting comfortable. He always has more for us. And he always wants to take us to the next level. And the Lord has been speaking that to me again and again. And, and very clearly in recent weeks, even after 30, how long have I been following you, Lord? 37 years of following Jesus faithfully. And I am discovering, even after 37 years, and I'm talking 37 years of passionately following Jesus, and I am discovering that there is always more with him. Has anyone else discovered that together with me yet? And um, I know the Lord is saying, I have more. I have more for my church. I have more for my sons and my daughters. But we have to be willing to go after the more. And, and I'm going to say this again, and to anyone um, who is new to Radiant, no, you don't get a crazy radical um, prophetic general leading worship every week at Radiant. It's very rare that you get this. But I am training up on the next prophetic <laughs> radical worship leader in my home. But, but I'm telling you, church, I know... I know what God has called me to do, and I know what he's called me to be. And um, what the Lord's calling on my life is not, does not make me popular. I get that. And I have had to die to myself and say, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll say whatever you want me to say. And I'm telling you, church, as I lock myself up in my closet for hours and hours every day, the Lord is telling me we have got to break out of the Americanized Christian church mold. Amen. It's not of God. It's a man-made religious structure. And the Lord this last week as I was in prayer, I don't know if I'll get to the notes, but you can always watch online and Pastor Todd will give you an amazing teaching <laughs> on the scriptures. But um, I'll, I'll never forget one day I was preparing to preach and, and uh, this was several years back and I thought, I'm going to try to be more like Todd. I'm going to try to be more of a teacher. And the Lord arrested my attention. And he reminded me of David when he tried to put on Saul's armor. And the Lord said, don't you dare put on Todd's armor. His armor was not fashioned for you. You walk in your armor. And that's a word for every one of us. Never compare yourselves to others and try to wear somebody else's armor. But it took me a long time to learn that, and, and I pray that you learn it long before I did. It seems like I was in my 50s before I finally was comfortable in my armor. And when I say comfortable, I mean comfortable in a very uncomfortable way, <laughs> because God doesn't call us to what's comfortable. But um, this last week, I met with another pastor here in town uh, from another church, and as we talked, the Lord had been showing her things and he had been speaking similar things to me and he brought me back to a dream I had back in 2012. And in this dream, I was asked to go to this building and it was a, some kind of, of a religious organization, but they had asked me to come to this building to preach the word of God. And to get into the opening and through the doorway, I had to go across this walkway. It was kind of like a bridge, but there wasn't water underneath it. It was just a walkway getting to the, the front of the building. So I'm, I have people who are leading me into the, the building to go to the platform to preach the word that God gives me. And I look down and I realize that the walkway is made out of wood that is rotting and decaying. And I could see shafts of light coming up through the decaying, rotting pieces of wood. And it was very unstable. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling really great about this, but I walk on in and when we go inside the building, they escort me to the platform and it's the same thing. The platform is built 
out of wood that is rotting and decaying. And I take one look at it, and it's like the Holy Spirit says, stop. I took one look at it, and I looked at the people, and I said, I can't stand on that platform. And they said, why not? People stand up there all the time and preach the gospel. And I said, because that foundation is rotting and decaying. I cannot stand on that platform. Well, the next thing I know in my dream, I am administrating uh, concrete trucks and construction crews, and they come in, they tear out the, the entire platform, they tear out the walkway going to the platform, and they replace it with solid concrete. So then I come back in after it's all finished, and they escort me back, and I have the green light from the Holy Spirit. Now the foundation is right. Now you can move forward. So I start to step up on the platform and, and panic struck me because I didn't have a, a message. And I said, Lord, what message do you want me to give? And the Lord said, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. I stepped up on that concrete solid foundation, that platform, and I, I spoke Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then the platform rotated, and I proclaimed it to the east. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And to the south, and I know this isn't the south, okay? But I started here, so bear with me. And the same thing, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then finally to the west, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I woke up. That was in 2012. And periodically, the Lord brings me back to that dream. But this last week, it has been intense. And it's interesting because today in the text, in Ephesians chapter 2, we're talking about the foundation. We're talking about the foundation of the church, the body of Christ. The foundation is the writings of the apostles and the prophets that wrote the canon of Scripture, of Holy Scripture. And it's written in Ephesians chapter 2 that this is our foundation and Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Give him praise and glory in this hour. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now, when you move away from Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone and you get your eyes off of him and you become consumed with yourself, you get your eyes on yourself. Three, was it three weeks ago, we went to Springfield, Missouri, to the World Prayer Center. And we were there with pastors and leaders, intercessors from around the country, interceding and crying out in this incredible, epic moment we're living in. God is calling every one of us to go to the next level in prayer and intercession. Don't think, well, I'm not called to be an intercessor. You know what I've learned, Lou? God's called all of his kids to be intercessors every one of us to some level. He's called every one of us to be intercessors. And so we're at the World Prayer Center and uh, we walk away one, one, of, the, one of the days and, and Joe is talking to us, Joe Odin. How many of you were here when Joe was here a couple weeks ago? Powerful, powerful, next level evangelist. We're so grateful for our connection with him. And um, I'll tell you what he's doing in the assemblies of God right now is what I saw in my dream. The foundations have begun to rot and decay as we've moved away from the Holy Spirit more and more. Now, I'm not saying completely, but I'm saying too, in too many churches within the assemblies of God, where they have become many churches, not just in the assemblies of God, but any church that is ashamed of the Holy Spirit, embarrassed by the Holy Spirit, refuses to teach and speak and instruct and pray for the Holy Spirit is a church that's built on a rotten and decaying foundation. And all the true followers of Jesus said amen. amen. And so what I see Joe doing right now is God has strategically anointed him and appointed him to go in and tear down the decaying foundations and build them back what, to, to be a solid foundation with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. This is our text in Ephesians chapter 2 today. And um, 
The thing that the Lord kept speaking to me, one of the things he kept speaking to me when we were there is so interesting. As I sought him and I would wait upon the Lord and say, Lord, what are you saying to your kids in this hour? This was the word I got in Springfield. Always remember to stay small in your own eyes. Turn to someone and tell them, remember to stay small in your own eyes. Stay small in your own eyes. Because when the church, when leaders in the church, when people in the church are no longer small in their own eyes, my kids laugh at me when I say this, but they become too big for their britches. <laughs> they become too big for the armor God's given them. And they expose themselves to the enemy. And the enemy comes in. In Isaiah, there's a very severe warning. There are many very severe warnings in Isaiah. But, but I will never forget this. When we were pastoring in San Diego, California, it was the last church growth conference I remember ever attending because I was so sickened by what I was hearing in those sessions where they were leading American pastors. I was so utterly, completely grieved and sickened over it. This was before faith was even born. And I walked away and we had gone to several church growth minister conferences throughout the years. And I told Todd, never again, never again will I submit myself to that kind of demonic doctrine from hell. And it's what pastors and leaders across America have been fed for the last several decades. And it's why the church in America today has rotten and decaying platforms, foundations, they're not built on the chief cornerstone and on the prophets and the apostles who wrote the Holy Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So friends, we're in a time right now where God is calling us to tear down what's rotten and decaying and to build back what's firm and certain and secure. It's the word of God and Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. Give him praise and honor this morning. He is always worthy of our highest praise. So today is Pentecost Sunday. And if we're going to build back the right foundation, we have to talk about Pentecost Sunday. Because it was on the day of Pentecost that the church of Jesus Christ, the New Testament church, was birthed. So any church, any group, any man, any woman that takes away from the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, friends, they're building on a faulty, rotten, decaying foundation. You cannot have a firm and solid foundation without Jesus Christ as a chief cornerstone and the Holy Spirit empowerment. Come on, are you with me today? Yes. And I want to repent today on behalf of the pastors, the teachers, the Christian leaders that have fed some of you lies and doctrines of devils. They are simply deceived themselves by the powers of darkness. Because any church, any pastor, any leader, and I know this is so different from Pastor Todd's message. <laughs> and that's okay. I think that's why God is saying in this hour, I want both prophet and teacher prophet and teacher. We need both. So I encourage you, after hearing the message today, go listen to the teaching going verse by verse. But, but what the Spirit of God is saying to us today is we have to build on the right foundation because if we don't, everything else will crumble. Pastor Todd and I, when we um, pastored in Texas, we had friends, um, Donnie and Tammy Johnson, and they lived in one of the most... Um, beautiful areas of our city, um, one of the most um, prosperous areas of our, our city. And it was called a, play, a neighborhood called Crown Colony. And they had a beautiful, beautiful home. But a few years into their home, they started having major issues with their house. And the reason was the foundation was faulty. And that's true for the church today. It's true for every one of our lives today. If we don't have the right foundation, everything else is going to crumble and fall. It's just a matter of time. And so God is calling us to come back 
to the prophets and the apostles, to the writing of Holy Scripture, to the Word of God, and to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So, I, again, I say I repent on behalf of those pastors and Christian leaders that, that told you, oh, you know what, church is all about you. You just come in, you kind of shop around, you find the church that, that satisfies you the, the best, that makes you feel good, and, and you know, we're, we don't want to say anything that might make you um, uncomfortable, and we certainly don't want you to feel convicted or motivated to change your life or the way you're living. We just want you to be comfy and cozy. It's all about you. I repent on behalf of the pastors that have taught that because it's not biblical. It's a rotten, decaying, faulty foundation. And why are so many people falling away in this hour? It's because of pastors and churches like that that say, well, we don't want to lose people. We don't want people to leave, so we're not gonna say anything hard. We're not gonna say anything that will make them uncomfortable. We just want them to feel comfy and cozy, tickle their itching ears. And God is saying, it's not a time for that. We have to wake up, and I want to, I want to congratulate and commend you for being here today, and I guarantee you, Satan will come and tell you, you need to leave this church. You need to go somewhere where it's comfortable and cozy, where you don't have to do anything. You're not, you're not stretched to do anything. You guys have heard me say this again and again, but people are a lot like rubber bands. They're not effective unless they're stretched. And we've got a lot of people sitting in, in churches all across America who are not effective because their leaders are pacifiers and not provokers. And God has called us to be provokers, to provoke each other to love and good works. That's in the Bible. That's what every one of us is called to. So on Pentecost Sunday, and it's interesting because most people in America aren't even aware that today is Pentecost Sunday. I'm not gonna ask how many of you came in and weren't aware of it. It's okay. but we have so many holidays now, it's hard to keep track of them all, is it not? I mean, you know, when it was just Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's, you know, the big ones. But now it's National Sunday, National Grandparents Day, National Daughters Day, National Dog Day, National Cat Day, National Star Wars Day, National Star Trek Day. I mean, the list is endless. But here's one that blew my mind. Did you guys know there is a National Hamster Day? How many of you knew that? No, nobody knew that? And it is on our son Luke's birthday. <laughs> so every April 12th, our son Luke is celebrated along with all the hamsters in the world. <laughs> That's crazy. But I think a day that most aren't even aware of, and a day that's the most important day, one of the most important days in history, is today. It's Pentecost Sunday. It's when the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out first upon the 120 passionate followers of Jesus who waited in Jerusalem just as Jesus had instructed them until they received the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. And I repent for any church, any pastor, any Christian leader in your life that has told you Pentecost is not important That's a doctrine of devils. Pentecost is very important. If you take away Pentecost, you have a faulty foundation. If you take away Pentecost, all you have is the arm of the flesh. All you have is what slick Christian leaders can do in the power of the flesh. And in Isaiah, we're warned, woe to you who go down to Egypt, and Egypt represents the world. He said, woe to you who go down to Egypt to get your counsel instead of seeking the face of God. So today, I'm telling you, I am praying for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire upon every one of God's sons and daughters. How many of you know we need that today? We cannot be the compromising, apathetic, lukewarm church 
that, that so many in the American churches have become, and I say this again, but that's why so many are falling away. So many are falling away. Why is it for the last several decades there is this exponential rise in the number of kids that grew up in church, but they go off to college and they fall away from the Lord? It's because the foundation was faulty. The foundation was lacking and, and they missed the cheap cornerstone and the cheap corners. You don't, you don't get Jesus without the Holy Spirit. You don't get the true Jesus without the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus was preparing the disciples for his departure. And he's telling them this is what's going to happen. And, and I'm sure they were, so, they were sullen. They were depressed and discouraged. They didn't want Jesus to go away. And Jesus said, no, it's good that I go away. He said, because if I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And in John 14, he tells them, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he said, when I go to the Father, this week, he said this right before the ascension, right before he went to the Father. He said, now, first, you're going to have to wait in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire. And he said, and the reason why is because if I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And because I'm going to the Father and sending the Holy Spirit, you're going to do the same works that I do and even greater works. Listen, guys, how many Christians do you know that, now this may be not fair in this church or a church like this, but how many Christians do you know that are casting out demons today? I mean, if you're here, you know we are. But, but, but Jesus said, you're gonna do the same works I did. And he said, those who believe in me, the first thing he said is they're gonna cast out demons. Every one of us. If we're not casting out demons, we have a faulty, rotten, decaying foundation. And God's saying, tear it out. Tear it out, Kelly. Tear it out. Tear it down. Because it's not mine. How many are, Jesus said, you will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Jesus said this. He said, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to empower you to do this. He said, you're going to heal the sick. You're going to raise the dead. Yes, I just said that. Because it's in the word. We have become so comfortable with what's common to the world, the flesh and the devil, that when we speak of what the apostles and the prophets said, people go, what? That's weird. No, it's uncommon. But God is uncommon. And he's called us to be uncommon people. Listen, that song we just got through singing. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we echo his authority. Jesus went to the Father not so that you could just sit and be happy and build up your nest egg and, and just play it safe and live a comfy life and go through the religious motions of fast food church in and out and just feel good, get enough, Jesus, just to make you feel like you're okay and you've done your duty. That's a faulty, rotten, decaying foundation. And God's saying, tear it out, tear it out now in Jesus' name. I know I'm crazy. I'm crazy for him. Friends, God's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Awaken, oh sleeper, arise. Arise and shine for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you for such a time as this. You are not placed here on the earth for this time to play it safe. You are not pla placed here to be self-consumed, self-absorbed, selfish, and focused on you and your comfort and your ease and your vacations and whatever else. If that's you, if you're living to play it safe, if you're living to be comfortable, you have a, foul, a, a faulty foundation. You don't have the foundation of the apostles and the prophets who gave everything for the cause of Christ. And God's saying, tear it out. Tear it out. We have put up with it for so long. We have this de decaying, rotten foundation 
And we keep bringing people in. Come in, come in, come in so that you can hear about Jesus. But the Jesus that we're preaching, if we have the wrong foundation, is a false Jesus. It's a golden calf. And God's saying, tear it down, tear it down, tear it out. In Jesus' name. So on the day of Pentecost, Jesus told them, being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. He said, don't you dare go out and try to do anything without the Holy Spirit. I want you to turn to someone and tell them, don't do anything without the Holy Spirit. He said, he commanded, this is the Holy Scripture, say he commanded. He commanded them, do not depart, but wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Isn't it interesting that there were 5,000 men plus women and children, so we're looking at approximately 12 to 15,000 people on the hillside. And when he fed them the miracle food, when he multiplied the loaves and the fish and fed multiple thousands, they were all there gobbling up that miracle food. But when he says, now go into Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit, how many went? 120. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be in the 120 crew. I'm going with the 120. Many are called, but few are chosen. Because few, only a few, are willing to tear out the faulty, rotten, decaying foundation. Instead, we dress it up. We try to dress it up and, and make it look pretty. And, and hey, as long as we pat people on the back and pat them on their sweet little heads and, and make them feel comfortable, they won't notice the faulty foundation. That's what we've been doing in the American church. Does anybody else see it? God's saying, tear it out. Tear it out. He's saying, I'm not pleased with it. I'm not pleased with it. So on the day of Pentecost, I believe it's time that we tear out faulty foundations and we come back to Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone and we come back to the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And why, what will we receive power for? He said, to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem right here where we live. He's called you to be a next level evangelist. If you're not fishing for men, if I'm not fishing, I'm not just preaching this to you, I'm preaching it to me. I preach it to myself every day. And I repent constantly for the times that I've ignored the promptings of the Holy Spirit because I thought I had my own agenda I had to accomplish. Listen, if you're not fishing for men, you have a faulty, rotten, decaying foundation. And that's, that's true for all of us because he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And then he ascends into heaven. He gives them this holy mandate, and then he goes to the Father. And so they go to Jerusalem together in one accord, say it with me, one accord, one accord. to seek the Lord together with all their heart and wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Some people, they go down one time or two times, or I don't know how many times, and, and they pray to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they say, well, nothing happened. I guess God doesn't want that for me. Again, that's a lie of the enemy. It's a faulty, decaying foundation. Because the foundation tells us that it's for all of God's children. That his intention is every one of us would be baptized. The Holy Spirit would indwell us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then come and empower us to do the same works Jesus did and even greater works. So they're assembled in Jerusalem, only 120. How many of you want to be a part of the 120? And I pray for every one of us that the fire of God will consume our hearts and burn up and burn out and burn away every stinking lie, hindrance, distraction, and obstacle of hell that keeps us from pursuing a deeper walk with him and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter two, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, what? Together. 
They were all together with one accord in one place. Yes, they were unified. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that was the day the New Testament church of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was launched like a sharpened arrow from the hand of Almighty God. Give him praise for the day of Pentecost. And we have 15 minutes left to go through the notes. But we have been in this series in Ephesians on what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, if you're truly in Christ, you've been given a new identity. You're a new creature. The old has passed away. I'll tell you, all I have to do is think about that and I wanna shout and dance all over again throughout all of eternity. Yeah, give him praise. We have a new peace. We have peace that passes human understanding. I'm, my mom, my 75-year-old mom, cut four of her fingers off on her right hand a week ago Friday. And um, they were able to salvage half of her pinky, her ring finger, her index finger, but she lost her entire middle finger. She's right-handed, so it looks, looks like she has a big, um, I don't know, a big mitt on her hand. And she's having to relearn how to do everything in life with her left hand. But she is an overcomer. It's amazing that she has the mind of Christ. And so she, no matter what is happening, even though she cut off her right hand, basically, and she's right-handed, she has joy and peace and assurance that God is going to take her through yet another obstacle. She lost two sons at the age of, one at the age of 14, one at the age of 24. Yet she had peace and has peace like a river. She has the peace of God that passes human understanding. She has the joy of the Lord. Why? Because her focus is not on this temporal life. It's on the life that is yet to come. It's on the eternal. And that is a key for the child of God, those who are in Christ. But we're going to pick up in Ephesians 2, 18. And you guys are going to have to listen to Pastor Todd's message. So you got a day of Pentecost sermon here. And you can get the Ephesians 2 version online. But in verse 18, it says, for through him, we both have access by one spirit into the Father. So, so we're hearing in Christ, we have come together, both Jew and Gentile. Why do we make a big deal about Israel? Because in Christ, we have come together, both Jew and Gentile. We are one in Christ. In the body of Christ, in the family of God, we have come together in Christ Jesus. We are the members, we are the members that make up the body, and he is the head. So we are all members, the scripture tells us, Paul tells us, as of one body, one family, and Jesus Christ is the head. So... Verse, that's verse 18, and I, I, I want to close by sharing this, this story. Um, you know, the enemy of our soul is always warring against us to keep us from having the right foundation. Because if he can get, a, get the wrong foundation, then everything else in our life will be unstable and, and unsecured. And, and so the enemy wars, and the main way he wars against us is where? In our mind. It's with those thoughts. It's with rogue thoughts that come to bring doubt, fear, bitterness, defiance, unholy rebellion. I mean, it's those thoughts that come to condemn, to accuse, to accuse us and to accuse others, to us, to accuse God. It's the battlefield of the mind. And I just recently heard uh, Tim Delina, the pastor at Times Square Church in New York, a fiery Pentecostal preacher with a solid foundation. And he talked about in 1927 when Charles Lindbergh completed the first successful transatlantic flight from New York to Paris. And he did that after several others had attempted to do it and failed. But he told about one pilot who took off and several minutes into the air, he heard a funny noise. 
It, and, and he realized, he looked down and he saw a nasty rogue rat gnawing away at the wires on his control panel. And so he's all strapped in into one of the first planes ever made. It's not like he can take it off and turn it over to a co-pilot and go and get rid of the rat. He is panicking and thinking, if I don't destroy this rat, this rat will destroy me. And that's exactly true for you and me when it comes to those rogue thoughts. If you don't destroy the rogue thoughts that come to steal, kill, and destroy your divine destiny and the plan and the purpose of God, those rogue thoughts will ultimately destroy you. How many of you know this is true? And so he's, he's panicking, thinking, I'm going to plunge into the icy waters of the Atlantic if I don't do something. And then it hits him. If he flew at an altitude high enough, it would kill the rat. The rat wouldn't be able to survive. So he puts on his own oxygen mask and he ascends. He throttles up. Say it with me. Throttle up. Throttle up. Higher and higher and higher until he is at an altitude to where that rogue rat croaked. <laughs> and then he could come back down and try to finish his flight. And, and I want you to get a picture of that because that's exactly what you and I deal with every day, with those rogue thoughts, with thoughts like, you don't need to praise God. You can just sit there and be silent. Why would the enemy give you a thought like that? Because Satan hates praise. He hates your praise because the scripture makes it clear your praise is a weapon against him. Every time you praise, God roars and demons tremble. So I'm going to tell you, take those rogue thoughts captive. You, you say to those thoughts that tell you, you don't need to praise God. You're introverted. You can just be quiet. You don't need to praise. When that happens, you say, here, little rat. Here, little rat. Come on, come on. I'm going to take you right here to Psalm 149, verse 6. You take that rogue thought and you slam it shut and destroy it with the sword of the Spirit. Are you with me today? When the enemy of your soul comes and those rogue thoughts come, well, I can't believe how horrible those pastors are. Can you believe? Can you believe what they're doing? Can you believe they provoke us to be warriors in a battle? Listen, you take them to the word of God and you say, here, little rogue thought, here, little rogue thought, because what does the scripture tell us to do? It says to take every thought captive and bring it into the obedience of Christ. And that's what we're doing when those rogue thoughts come to kill, steal, and destroy. When they come to you to tell you to gripe and grumble and complain about your husband, about your wife, when they, when they come to you and try to convince you that you should be bitter, you have every right to be bitter, you have every right to be offended. You bring them to the word of God. You say, here, little rogue thought, here, little, you take it captive and you bring it to the word of the Lord. And you said, freely, I have been forgiven. Freely, I forgive in Jesus' name. And you shut it on that rogue thought. You take it captive and give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, like that rogue rat, your rogue thoughts will destroy you. Those rogue thoughts that come and tell you, your marriage is over. Your marriage is hopeless. You need to file for divorce today. You take it to the word of God and say, no, in Jesus' name. When those rogue thoughts come and tell you, oh, you have every right to be depressed. You have every right to have a pity party. You should just feel sorry for yourself. Why don't you go ro ro crawl, crawl into a corner and just suck your thumb and cry and feel sorry for yourself? You say, come here, you little rogue, you rogue rat thoughts. Come, little rogue rat thought. Come on, come on, come on. And you take it to the word of God and you say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and all that is within me. Whoops, bless his holy name. <laughs> This is a big Bible. I should have gotten a smaller one for this illustration. But God is telling every one of us in the passage from Ephesians 2 this weekend, throttle up, friends. He says, set your mind on things above. Those who are in Christ, we don't have our minds constantly on the things of the world. If your mind is constantly on the temporal things of this life, 
I guarantee you, you're going to, it's just a matter of time before you spiral into the icy waters of darkness, despair, and depression. Every time I get my eyes off of Jesus, off of eternity, off of souls and the harvest, listen, every one of us that is trying to store up wealth on earth for us, every one of us trying to store up treasure on earth, it's all going to burn. We can't take any of it with us. The only thing we take with us is souls. And every time I get my eyes off of Jesus and off of the harvest, I start, it's like the little rat, rogue rats are chewing away at the control panel in my heart and in my soul. And I know it's just a matter of time and I start spiraling down into the icy waters of self-pity and depression and despair, feeling sorry for myself. Come on, guys, can I get a witness? Does anybody else experience this? And so the next time that happens, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to remind you. Did we have the picture of the little rat that I found? I, I want you to get a picture of that little rat. And you know, we, we think, oh, he looks so cute. And isn't that what we've done even with the demons in culture today? Instead of casting them out, instead of taking them down, we medicate them and we try to make them feel comfortable. And we try to legislate and mandate that everyone leave the little demons alone because they're so cute and they're so sweet and, and so they continue to oppress and annihilate uh, generation after generation after generation. But God is saying there's nothing friendly or kind about that rat. And so every, I want you to start to think about every thought you have that is not good, pure, lovely, virtuous, deserving of praise, of a good report, if it does not line up with the heart of the Father for you, you cast it down. You bring it into the obedience of Christ. Are you with me? Amen. I want to ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet. You know, pray for Pastor Todd as he hears this message. But, you know, God would give me no peace. He would give me no peace about just sticking to my notes. And he was reminding me of the armor and saying, are you willing to do what doesn't make sense to you? Are you willing to go against human reasoning and your natural understanding to just open your mouth and let me fill it? How many of you know the Lord spoke to you today through this? And it's time for all of us to throttle up. So if you're ready, if you're ready to throttle up, I'm going to ask you just to, I know I do this a lot, but I'm going to ask you to lift your hands as an act of surrender. You're just saying, God, I, I don't, I don't want to be in control. And I don't know if we have any music, but I do like music to close out. But just lift up your hands as an act of self control, an act of, of surrender, self surrender. And if this is your heart, I want to ask you just to say this together with me, Lord. Hang, Lord, you know what you've called me to. You know where my foundation has been rotten and decaying. And today, I surrender all. Come in, Lord. Take over. I repent for trying to build on a faulty foundation. And today, I submit to your Lordship once again. I will do what you want me to do. I will say what you want me to say. I will go where you want me to go. And I will destroy every lie, every rotten, decaying piece of the foundation in my life. I'm tearing it out in Jesus' name. Now, Holy Spirit, I partner with you to rebuild a firm foundation that is based solely 
upon the word of God. With Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone and the Holy Spirit empowering me to be your witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now give him praise. Lord, we're shifting. We're shifting. And Lord, when you show me these things, my heart burns within me for 12 years, God. You have been burning those images of those faulty, rotten, decaying foundations in my heart and in my mind for 12 years. And Lord, we know that it's time. It's time to tear them down. It's time to tear them out. It's time to return to the firm foundation of your word. Your word is truth. And when our lives, when our families, when our churches, when our nation is built upon the solid foundation of the word of God with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, Everything else is stable and will not be shaken. The storms of life may come. Battles and trials and tribulation will come, but we will not be shaken because our lives, our families, our churches are built on the solid foundation of truth with the Lord Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone and the Holy Spirit empowering us. And Lord, I pray today that every one of your sons and daughters that is in the hearing of my voice would be filled with a desperate hunger and thirst to be who you called them to be, to do what you called them to do, and to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.